Okay, so the brand new Rocket Lake CPUs from Intel have finally arrived. And I actually received one 11900K CPU last Friday with the Z590 Dark motherboard from EVGA. And I thought about doing a short, like first impressions video about this whole uh, CPU model, like how it overclocks and about this whole launch overall. So uh, the main difference between this generation over the previous generations is that now we finally have some actual IPC improvements over the previous Skylake architecture. So Intel has been using the very same Skylake architecture for five to six years. The only way they have been able to improve the same uh, CPU architecture is by uh, increasing, the increasing the clock speeds or by increasing the core count of the CPUs. And maybe the only negative side about this whole uh, launch is that the uh, core count of the highest end option has gone down from 10 cores to 8 cores. So that's a bit of a question mark. So if you run, let's say, a very golden 10900K, is there any reason to upgrade to the 11900K? So uh, it's very likely that the overall performance is worse with the 11900K in very uh, like standard uh, multi-threaded workloads. The only case where the 11900K could actually outperform the 10900K even if the even if the um, software can utilize all of the uh, cores uh, of, of both of the CPUs is that if the software if the particular uh, software can utilize the AVX 512 instruction sets that are present on the 11900K, which are not present on the 10900K. So just saying. The, uh, we have PCI Express 4.0 finally on uh, this generation, but that doesn't really uh, give you that much uh, benefit over the 3.0. So uh, we already discussed about this uh, in some of my previous videos. So uh, for example, uh, in 3 Mark Paul Royal, AMD hasn't been faster with the RTX 3090 compared to the mainstream Intel like Z490 with PCI Express 3.0. So, uh, but that could obviously change soon in the future once we get uh, new graphics cards and so on that might utilize more PCI Express bandwidth. But yeah, so uh, now the memory controller is also uh, very similar to the one that's present on uh, the latest AMD Ryzen CPUs. So once you go uh, high enough on the memory frequency, the memory controller, the memory controller will go to one to two ratio. So uh, the internal memory controller frequency will go down to 50% and that should allow you to reach much higher memory frequencies, at least in theory. So far, I wasn't able to reach like significantly higher memory frequencies. And now I'm just running very simple XMP level timings at 4800 megahertz. But the uh, good thing that I noticed is that, well, at least the Z590 Dark is doing, is that common rate one is very easy to run now, even for daily use. So the Z590 Dark always can load the common rate one very, very easily without doing any uh, special settings or so on. The cache seems to be quite a bit worse compared to the previous generation. So I couldn't really get much higher uh, on the cache than 4.6. If I try to boot like 4.8 to 4.9, even with high voltage, it will just hang when it tries to load to the operating system, so to say. Now, when it comes to overclocking, these CPUs aren't very like amazing when talking about pure numbers. So far, these seem to overclock uh, a little bit worse compared to the previous Comet Lake or Coffee Lake CPUs. So uh, the highest frequency I was able to do in very simple uh, non-AVX all-core workload like Cinebench R15 is 5.3 gigahertz across all of the eight cores at 1.46 volts set on the CPU and it's pretty much that value under load with correct load line calibration setting. So uh, the main difference when it comes to overclocking is that now the physical size of the cores themselves are much larger than before. If I'm sure many of you have already uh, watch the video about this change by Devour. So the physical size of the cores is larger. So now the temperatures are a lot better than before. So uh, we can use much 
higher voltage values safely. So 1.46 volts and look the average of the core maximums is only like 72 I think 72 73 so uh, 1.45 volts with 11900k is pretty much the same thing as 1.35 volts with a 10900k or at least it feels like so so uh, I think if you run a very good like custom water cooling loop you can use up to 1.45 to even 1.5 volts safely for daily use for AVX based workloads you need to utilize the uh, AVX negative offset so the score was 2724 I'm, I'm not fully sure what was the score with uh, let's say a 1900k at this kind of frequency I think it was something like 23 something 2300 to 2400 when I ran the 5.5 uh, gigahertz video with the 1000k, 1000k at 5.5 gigahertz could reach or could get around 3050 points in R15. So uh, the 1100k is obviously behind the 1000k in this kind of workload due to the uh, difference in the actual core count. But there's definitely a significant uh, IPC improvement like 10 to 20 percent so that's obviously a good thing so let's see what's the score in the single core test so uh, this is pretty much the same frequency uh, what the CPU is running at stock when it comes to single core performance so Intel advertises the 11900k as uh, 3.5 stock then uh, 4.8 turbo for uh, uh, all core workloads and up to 5.3 for single threaded workloads uh, using the thermal velocity boost thingy so the maximum speed it should have is 5.3 in some single threaded applications so I think so I couldn't do Cdbench R20 at 5.3 at all even when I set the voltage up to 1.5 volts it uh, runs the test for a while and then it fails so the CPU so this particular CPU cannot do 5.3 daily for non-ABX all-core workloads. I think the highest speed would be 5.2 then lower in ABX based workloads with the negative offsets like minus 200 to minus 300 for standard ABX and ABX2 applications and maybe minus 300 to minus 400 for ABX 512 applications as the power consumption will go up a lot in workloads that can really utilize the AVX instruction sets then uh, you should use the per core overclocking when you really want to get all of the uh, overclocking potential out of the CPU uh, for daily use so the score is 268 so uh, a stock 1100k should be getting somewhere around this mark by default so now I think we could try Geekbench 3 as the memory controller performance does seem to be quite good on this particular uh, uh, CPU generation so uh, let's actually see so 64 bit and let's finish the test and see what kind of score we will get I think with the 1000k I could get like 53400 at 5.4 gigahertz but obviously the memory configuration was a little bit different so let's see what we can actually get okay so 50,659 so that's definitely a good score and uh, this memory score is absolutely insane considering that I'm only running like 4800 megahertz on the memory with very basic timings so uh, yeah it's definitely much faster than 1900k and it's not really that much behind compared to the, the 1900k so it's pretty good if you ask me so uh, 59 443 and 62 25 I think this score was something like 69,000 on uh, the 1000k at 5.4 so that's pretty good I think and now I will just show you that this will crash R20 quite quickly so uh, let's open R20 I think most people use R20 nowadays since it's a little bit newer compared to the R15 but this will fail I already tested it so after this I could try what's the voltage requirement for 
5.2 in R20. So now we crashed and now we need to go back to the bars. Okay, and at 1.4 set volts, I was able to pass Cinebench R20 at 5.2 gigahertz across all of the eight cores. Uh, I actually had to drop the cache speed from 4.6 down to 4.5, as 4.6 was giving me issues in R20. So the cache isn't very good at all on these brand new CPUs, based on my first impressions. So uh, yeah, so 5.2 is definitely uh, possible in R20, but 5.3 is too much on the edge, even at 1.5 set volts. But the temperatures went bad at all, like look, 65, 64, 69, only 62. So the average of the core maximums was only like uh, 65, 66 at 1.4 volts. So that kind of proves that uh, the temperatures are very good on this brand new uh, generation. So uh, 6486 points, that's the score with 1100K at this speed. I think uh, 1900K CPU at the same frequency scores something like 5600 points so if you do the math the 1100k is 16 percent faster in r20 at same frequency so the ipc is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent in some cases so that's pretty good if you ask me it's, it's like a proper upgrade for a very long time now i think as the last as the last thing i could try like what's the maximum uh, single core overclock I can achieve but so far yeah I this pretty much seems to be it so uh, nothing too wo nothing too wonderful when it comes to overclocking headroom on air or water cooling but good temperatures and we don't have to do any kind of deleting as these are soldered and uh, the temperatures aren't bad at all that's not an issue at all if you ask me so now I will go back to the bars and let's see what kind of single core overclock we could achieve. Okay, so the per core overclocking is actually a little bit different on the, this generation compared to the previous ones. So uh, before we usually had different uh, CPU multipliers for different kinds of loads. So let's say like a CPU multiplier for up to two core loads and up to four core loads. But now we have individual uh, core multipliers for individual cores and they will remain at that uh, multiplier in even in all core workloads. So I'll show you by running Cinebench R15. So uh, at the moment I'm running the first two and the last core at 5.4 and the rest five at 5.3. So this way we don't have to sacrifice the entire CPU frequency if we only have let's say a one weaker core. So if only uh, one core is giving us issues we can use one notch lower multiplier on that one and a higher one on the rest. So uh, now by doing this we could achieve uh, an average effective clock of almost 5340. So we could gain almost 40 megahertz by uh, using the per core overclocking function over the uh, fixed uh, overclock multiplier across all of the eight cores, so to say. And uh, I think Windows knows how to recognize the fastest core. So if we open, let's say, uh, or if we run the CPU single core test, I think it should run it on the fa some of the fastest cores. So at the moment, the uh, so it was stressing the first core and now last core and now the second core. So it does use the uh, fastest cores and it varies a little bit. So. Uh, that shouldn't be an issue, so this is definitely a little bit different than before, so I cannot actually test the maximum uh, single core overclock that easy, because uh, I cannot set, uh, let's say, like a, a CPU multiplier for up to one core load. So if I set, let's say, uh, 5.5 or 5.6 multiplier on the strongest core, it will crash, because it will still keep that multiplier uh, even in uh, all core workloads and it doesn't remain stable when the whole CPU is being stressed due to temperatures but it would re remain stable if that if, if only that specific core was being stressed uh, I'm sure you know what I mean because if in, uh, in this kind of single core load the temperature is only like 50 degrees on the one on the single core itself and it would be like 70 something if the whole CPU was being stressed now when it comes to Cinebench R20, I could uh, run the test with the whole CPU almost at 5.3. So I could run 5.3 multiplier 
on all of the uh, uh, different cores apart from the two weakest cores. So the weakest cores on uh, this particular uh, CPU are the fifth and the sixth cores. So uh, I actually tested all of the individual cores on the CPU and these two cores are always uh, among the hardest and they cannot run the R20 at 5.3. They uh, can run it for a brief moment, but it will always fail at the end, even at 1.5 volts. So uh, by doing the per core overclocking, I could run an effective average overclock of 5 to 75 in Citibench R20 at 1.45 volts. So I could gain 75 megahertz on the whole CPU by running uh, individual uh, core multipliers instead of a big instead of, a, let's say, a fixed all-core multiplier. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, I think it's I think this whole platform is kind of cool and the IPC improvements are definitely proper. Now, uh, would I recommend buying this based on my first impressions? It depends on what you are running at the moment and what, and what kind of system you want. If you are running any kind of like uh, older setup, like an old Intel uh, system or old AMD system, then uh, I think the Rocket Lake is great. The price of this particular CPU model is a little bit too high and uh, yeah, it's sad that it's an 8-core CPU instead of a 10-core CPU. So if you run, let's say, a very good 1900K, it's very likely you will not get any uh, performance uh, increase in very basic all-core uh, workloads. Only in those scenarios where the particular software can utilize all of the available AVX inst instruction sets, including the AVX 512, it's very possible that the 11900K could outperform the 1900K even with two less cores, but just saying. Now uh, stay tuned, I will be uh, making more footage later, especially about memory overclocking once I get a better bars for the Z500 Dark and uh, some uh, LN2 overclocking tests and, and uh, similar things later, so stay tuned. But uh, yeah, this is pretty much it. So uh, leave a comment down below if you are going to buy any of these new uh, Rocket Lake CPUs and what you think about this whole platform. And, but otherwise, thanks for watching one of my videos once again, and I will see you on the next one.